Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome back to the third and unfortunately final day of our Daria Beyond Europe workshop. Um, today is the one where we have to do some hard work. So I just want to keep that in mind. So keep stocked up on the coffee and the cookies. Um, because what we would really like, so if I just go through the day, because we've um, changed it from the printed programs a little and um, the uh, program on the website. So in a few moments, we'll start with our closing keynote, double keynotes um, from Laurie and Stuart regarding collections and data. After which, I'll give a very brief introduction to a um, comparable um, uh, initiative that is happening in Europe, the Heritage Data Reuse Charter. Then we'll have time for coffee. And then afterwards, uh, Laurie and Stuart will guide us through in a little bit more detail into some of the aspects so we can get into diving deeper a little bit into the Collections as Data Initiative. Then we have lunch, and this is where the program changes a little bit. So um, as we... Uh, as on Tuesday, I think it was, um, many people gave feedback that the lightning talks um, went, were really an exciting part of the program. So we'd like to give the opportunity um, for people to give more lightning talks. I know um, Abby says that a couple of people have already signed up, um, but if you still would like to share some of your research and practices um, in a brief lightning talk session, please get in touch with Abby and we will arrange that. Also, we had yesterday, um, um, Toma uh, changed the program round so that we, we thought this would fit better in with the discussions this afternoon. So he will give um, the vision towards um, the new Daria marketplace, which will be an ideal opportunity to see how we can uh, collaborate further in that area. Then the final session we've called Infrastructure, Sustainability and International Collaboration. Where are we and why, where might we want to go together? So in my dreams, um, I would really like to get at least three, so three concrete actions that we could really want to take forward. So this session, and it may, we, if we don't need all this time, we can, we can condense that activity, but I would really love to see just an hour thinking what would we like to do? What are our top three priorities? And most importantly, what are the next concrete steps we can take? I know t discussing people with uh, coffee and everything, um, there are a lot of ideas out there, but if we can make some real concrete action plans um, in order to make this not just a fantastic collaborative event, but as a catalyst for the future. Does anybody have any comments, questions, uh, feedback at this stage? It's still too early. I know what that feels like. Okay, so um, I'm extremely excited. I came across, if I can just tell you a personal anecdote. So um, a colleague from my, who now works with Mikko in Finland, um, he said, oh, have you heard of this Collections as Data on, twi on Twitter? He said, oh, it's, it sounds really cool. So then... He put me in contact with Thomas Padilla, who um, was the uh, um, original in, um, principal investigator who started this initiative. And since then, I've been hooked. So I was delighted that um, Laurie and Stuart would be able to introduce um, the Collections as Data Initiative, because I think this is really crucial. Um, it's one of the, the biggest challenges, I think, in humanities research now, and as we have more digital methods used in humanities research. We need to get those collections um, enabled, so computationally available. Um, so I'm delighted that uh, Laurie and, and Stuart. So if you don't know already know, Laurie Allen is a co-principal investigator of the Collections as Data Initiative and also assistant director uh, for digital scholarship in the UST University of Pennsylvania Libraries. Um, before joining Penn Libraries in February 2016, uh, Laurie worked as coordinator for the digital scholarship team at the Haverford College Libraries. 
Stuart is co-investigator of the Collections as Data Initiative and Managing Director of the Price Lab for Digital Humanities at the University also of Pennsylvania. Um, prior to that, he served as the Digital Scholarship Librarian at UNC Chapel Hill and at the digital, as Digital Scholarship Coordinator at Emory. So I'm very pleased to welcome both uh, Laurie and Stuart and uh, love to hear all about the initiative. Um, thanks so much for having us here. So um, as you heard, I'm Lori Allen, the Director for Digital Scholarship at the University of Pennsylvania Libraries, and this is my colleague Stuart Varner, who is the Managing Director at the Price Lab for Digital Humanities. While we both work at Penn now, um, I'm in the library and Stuart is in the School of Arts and Sciences, we're going to talk today about work that we both got involved with before either one of us came to Penn. Um, it's obviously called Collections as Data. You, you can see that and you already know. You'll hear specifically about two projects we've been involved in and we'll also talk a little bit about the implications that we see for this work in terms of humanities infrastructure and the ways that institutions like libraries, archives and museums engage with the cultural and historical record more broadly. Um, Stuart and I were invited to present together and in true collaborative fashion, we're gonna switch back and forth a few times over the course of this. <laughs> so over to Stuart. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for getting up early and, and coming out for this. Um, and thanks for having us here. This is uh, really exciting. Uh, so before we get started, I wanted to do a little, a couple of administrative things. Uh, so up on the screen, uh, we have the project website. You can check that out. That's where a lot of the things that we wind up producing actually winds up living. Um, and there's also a, a link for the Google group uh, if you want to join that, we, we don't spam people too much, but it is a good way to, to keep track of, of what's going on. Um, so like Lori said, we're gonna talk about two different but pretty intimately connected projects. Um, the first one was funded by the, uh, the IMLS uh, for it's a national forum, national? Forum. Yeah, forum uh, <laughs> program. Uh, and the second was funded by the Scholarly Communications Program at the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Um, it's been really wonderful to work with both of these organizations and we obviously thank them for their generosity. Um, it's also been a real honor and a pleasure to work with some really amazing partners. So we've got our partners up here on the screens. Um, uh, and I guess I, just to reiterate, you know, Lori and I are here because it's pretty easy for us to get down here from Philadelphia. So we're, we're really just, we're representing the work of a lot of people. Um, and we're happy to do that. We hope we do a good job. <laughs> This one's me, just for one slide. Um, so as you'll see, this work has grown really far beyond uh, these tiny, tiny personal beginnings. But for me personally, I started thinking about collections as data while working at Haverford College with colleagues in special collections and a faculty member who taught about the history of medicine. We had just acquired in the library the papers of the Friends Hospital, which was among the earliest um, institutions specifically designed to treat people who were mentally ill. Its full name at the time that it was founded in 1813 was the Friends Asylum for the Relief of Persons Deprived of the Use of Their Reason. So we had these log books that the person who ran that had, um, and their 19th century handwriting in a kind of sort of semi-structured way. Um, and we decided that thinking, we had been doing a lot of thinking about what constitutes sort of successful digitization. And we really felt like taking pictures of 19th century handwriting would not make this work available or useful um, for people. If you wanna look at the things, you should really just come and look at them. So we did this experiment in offering the log books as a table, like the one you see here. Um, and that's what I had in, rather than, and then having students actually produce, produce data visualizations and think about engaging with this collection as data. So that's where I was coming from when I met up with this um, band of awesome, mostly librarians uh, who together formed the Collections as Data project. So I guess I'll explain why, why I'm here. Uh, 
So I, I think I got involved in this mostly because of a project I did at the University of North Carolina uh, working, uh, it's called the Doc South Data Project. Uh, so documenting the American South is a very long running digital collection. I think it got started in 94 or five. Um, it's just you know, exactly what you think. It's a TEI enabled collection of digitized uh, special collections material. Actually, an awful lot of it's transcribed because uh, when it first got on the internet, the internet wasn't big enough for that many pictures. Uh, so <laughs> it was just uh, text files. Um, and the idea was to put this stuff online so people didn't have to go through the trouble of getting down to Chapel Hill uh, to look at it. Um, but after seeing some topic modeling work, particularly stuff that Rob Nelson was doing at uh, the University of Richmond, uh, we decided to try to figure out a way to make the DocSouth collections available as data, you know, available for computational research. Um, so what you see on the screen uh, on, your, yeah, on the left side is what the old school DocSouth looks like. Um, and you can see you know, uh, screen image and then links to the transcriptions. What you see on the right side is what DocSouth data looks like, and it's, it's horrible. You don't want to read that, uh, but your computer loves reading that. Uh, so um, what we did was uh, got all of the, those text files in order, zipped them up, and put them on the web so you can just do a bulk download of the whole collection and throw them into whatever text analysis program you, you're interested in. Um, so that's DocSouth data. So uh, in talking to friends about you know, my specific project and their projects that were similar, uh, it became really obvious that generally speaking, the development of digital collections has focused on replicating traditional ways of interacting with objects in the digital space. Uh, unfortunately, this approach does not meet the needs of researchers, students, journalists, and others who want to use computational methods and tools to work, uh, to work on these digital collections. Um, in order to meet these emerging needs and to make the most of this opportunity, we need to reimagine some pretty core aspects of uh, cultural heritage institutions. But if we do this, if, if the transformations are kind of dramatic, if, we're, if we really are kind of reimagining what these institutions can be, we also need to take care not to reproduce or exacerbate longstanding problems in those institutions. Uh, people who are invisible in the archives, people who are completely left out. Uh, so, and it's worth noting that both um, Lori and I had, <coughs> you know, kind of culturally sensitive projects. Lori is dealing with uh, uh, people with mental disabilities. Mine, uh, one of the Doc South data collections is uh, comprised of narratives from enslaved people. Um, these aren't politically neutral collections, and they need to be handled, you know, with care and with, uh, you know, thoughtful sensitivity. So um, that was a pretty good conversation that we had with all of our friends, and we wound up applying for this uh, national forum grant with, uh, with IMLS. Um, the way that usually works, and I didn't really know this, um, the way it usually works is a team uh, spends a year researching and then at the end has some sort of national forum where they re re uh, talk about what they discovered and bring in some people they may have met. Uh, we actually did things completely out of order and uh, started our, uh, prog uh, our process with a national forum. Uh, we brought people who were uh, working in all sorts of aspects of, of libraries and particularly digital libraries uh, to just hear what they were talking about. And um, after hearing from people, you know, this is kind of what we, well, take that back. Uh, you know, uh, so when we wrote the, uh, when we wrote the grant, these are the things that we said we would do, and this slide will re-emerge later <laughs> with some caveats. Uh, so we said we would you know, create a framework uh, for, and I'm, <laughs> I'm stumbling here because that was really tricky, what does that even mean? Uh, and um, develop uh, uh, use cases and personas. Uh, we thought this would be helpful for libraries if you want to release collections as data, you might need to know how people will use those collections and what they might be and who they might be. Um, and also um, produce functional requirements uh, that support the development of technical solutions. That was really hard, uh, so we'll come back to that. 
So as I said, oh, this is you, sorry. Stuart said. <laughs> He's reading it and it says, as Stuart said. As, as I said. <laughs> as Stuart said, we started with the meeting, right? We started by gathering all these people so we could make sure to bring a lot of perspectives. Each <clears throat> member of the project team had their own um, notion of what is necessary to for collections as data, but it wasn't obvious how to generalize those ideas, how to, how to make them useful for other people. And we wanted the guidance we offered our community, and our community is mostly library, archival, and museum professionals, but we wanted that advice to be informed by a fuller range of perspectives. So some of the most um, exciting possible uses of collections as data are actually in, I would say, in um, social science fields, but our uh, forum was pretty heavily represented by humanities scholars. We had Gabrielle Foreman, who is one of the leaders of the Colored Conventions Project. We had Tim Sherritt, whose project, The Real Face of White Australia, contends with the National Archives of Australia as data. Miriam Posner, who in addition to doing her own brilliant research, thinks beautifully about teaching digital humanities methods and approaches. We had Ben Schmidt, who has done mountains of cool work using collections as data, um, and especially in exploring MARC data um, as data and, and learning from it. Jen Giuliano, a scholar who works in the ethics of working with indigenous materials, and Alan Liu, who has been involved in digital textual analysis for many, many years, and who's also kind of an early critical voice on the lack of criticism in DH. So in addition to all those scholars, we were also joined, it was like 25 people or something. We were also joined by brilliant software developers who build software in libraries, who need, who, whose questions are quite precise and specific, who need actual, they, they're not, the, the notion that this is all too complicated is actually not useful for them. Um, and we were joined by metadata specialists who wanted to help us think about what are the standards? How does this stuff get described? We need rules for how we describe it. Um, and also from folks from the Open Knowledge Foundation and the Internet Archive for their perspectives. Open Knowledge Foundation does a lot of really cool work on what, something called frictionless data, which I'm very interested in, and then the Internet Archive for reasons that I think are clear after this um, last couple of days. So I, I spent a lot of time on who was there because I think it's important because we, we made all those people, all those brilliant people who we gathered sit in groups like tables like these and have really hard conversations and write a lot of stuff. And then a lot of what you'll see, what Stuart will describe that was produced, was produced from the notes that they made, from the conversations that they had. Um, we had articulated that collections as data was sort of responding to this notion of, of the what we make available in libraries and archives and museums assumes a one at a time, but saying what collections as data are not doesn't, is not enough information for figuring out how to produce collections as data. So, um, so we, we, we got people together and we started really thinking, and then there is this question, so what about all the variety in what constitutes data for computation? Um, or what constitutes appropriate metadata and paradata and context? What kinds of assumptions are we making about people's technical needs or pr proclivities? Um, we got advice like show different levels of how to pursue a project with a CSV, one, with, um, one example with exposed API queries, with a GitHub repo and thousands of data files. These are all great possibilities and the, well, which one and for what um, kept coming back. We also got this question, what context are libraries responsible for when they publish collections as data? And we got advice that really ran the gamut. Well, we have to be practical, and at the same time, we don't want to be wholly irresponsible. Um, and we also, beyond the technical and policy concerns, which were formidable, this work forces us to consider our collections in a different light, to talk about, as Stuart said, what has been excluded from them, and um, how what we have needs to be contextualized. We need to be careful not to put all this energy, because it's a lot of work, into producing something that re-inscribes a problematic canon. This is a bunch of humanists. We can't act or assume that data are neutral, that library collections are neutral, or that the act of collecting, contextualizing, and turning something into data are not scholarly and political acts in themselves. So questions came up like, is there a line between what decisions and standardization the library should be doing versus the tasks that should be left to the researcher? Um, I'm not going to answer any of these questions, so don't get your hopes up. <laughs> um, and re sort of reminded that there are assumptions and problematic conclusions that we have made in the past that need to be documented and accounted for. And this is true across every aspect of the workflow. So 
it's clear that it can't just be a transformation, um, that every collection needs to be treated in its own way. And so sort of the first thing we did after um, was this, and now it's Stuart's turn. So y you can think back to that previous slide where we sh I showed the three things that, uh, that we told IMLS we would do. We did not tell them that we would produce something called the Santa Barbara Statement, uh, mm -hmm. but we did it anyway. Uh, after we had this meeting in Santa Barbara, um, it just became obvious that you know, we, there had to be some way to compile everything that we'd learned into one place, uh, that there was some sort of need to relatively clearly say not only what collections this data means, uh, at least to the group, uh, but also uh, document some of the questions and some of the challenges and some of the nuances uh, that were unpacked uh, in that first forum. Um, so it's called the Santa Barbara Statement. I'm not sure anyone's totally happy with that name, uh, <laughs> but that's what it was. We were, to, to give you some of the background, we were sort of looking around for, you know, what are similar things, and we were like, oh, well, there's like, you know, is this kind of like starting a conversation about open access? Is this kind of like starting a conversation about, you know, whatever? Um, <clears throat> so a lot of those things were, you know, the something something manifesto or the you know, name of the place where the meeting happened. So it's, this isn't a manifesto, it's just kind of a statement, um, and it happened in Santa Barbara. Um, but um, to be clear, we didn't just, it wasn't like the five, six of us, five of us, six of us, uh, you know, stayed a day later and just wrote the statement and released it into the world. We sort of compiled all of our notes and then sent it back out to everyone who had been at the forum. Um, and ask them to double check and to comment. Uh, so this is sort of a screenshot of, uh, of the statement being written with some notes and hypothesis off to the side. Um, and not only that, we also kind of shopped it around at some different conferences, you know, definitely let as many people read it as were willing to read it uh, and solicited comments for about a year. Mm -hmm. <coughs> um, <coughs> Um, oh, right, so here's a list of, of all the conferences uh, we went to. Um, and the end result uh, is a Santa Barbara statement with uh, 10 principles. Um, each, if you go to the website and look at this, each principle is, <coughs> is unpacked a little bit. Uh, so th this is just the first sentence from each, I think. Um, so that was the first product we produced that we didn't say we were going to do. Uh, the next thing we did that we didn't say we were going to do uh, is something called facets. Um, people, you know, after we would sort of explain what we mean, <coughs> what we mean by collections as data, then people would look for some examples. Well, who has done this? What does that look like? What does it take? So facets were a way to ask people to explain their process for creating collections as data. Uh, so we have things from uh, from the Penn Libraries, from the American Philosophical Society, from MIT, just different places who have been involved in creating collections as data, just walking through uh, what their process has been. Um, uh, and I guess specifically what those facets do is describe uh, why they do it, uh, how did they make the case, um, how did they do it, um, and then we ask people to share any documentation they have. Um, and then sort of a, a section on, you know, what should people know uh, about your, your process? So a third thing to talk about, um, and this is something we actually did say we would do, is uh, creating personas. Has anyone used personas in project development? So, okay, so it's relatively common. You, you think of all the different kinds of people who might uh, use your, your product and imagine what their motivations are and, and what they might need. And it's a, it can be a useful exercise when you're thinking about functionality. Uh, so we have, I used to know how many, now we have many more. A bunch, we have a lot. We have of a personas. bunch of personas on the website. Um, and one thing we might do later uh, is like see if- today. Yeah, like, <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> is ask you to uh, think about if there are any gaps in our list of personas and if you'd maybe like to add one. Uh, that 
can certainly be an ongoing uh, collection. Let's see. Um, so then, uh, somewhat moving chronologically, uh, there was also a second forum. Uh, <laughs> and I think we need to jump in here and just mm -hmm. say, we actually just didn't spend all our money. So we, had, we were like, what do we do with more money? So a second forum. Right. Yeah, so that, that's what happened. We uh, Unfortunately, Thomas had moved from Santa Barbara to Las Vegas. So the next forum was in Las Vegas, which is different. Um, so um, one sort of interesting thing about the second forum was we spent way less time trying to get on the same page about what collections as data means. It seemed like in the course of that year, uh, the idea had really sort of percolated percolated through the community. Um, it, it was also clear that our original idea to produce functional requirements was just too simple. We had originally imagined, well, what if there was like, you know, some sort of guidebook with, you know, do these 20, 25 things, uh, and you have collections as data. <clears throat> it just doesn't, it wouldn't work. Uh, there were too many variables, too many different contexts. Um, so Lori's going to get into this in more detail in a moment, but the reason we, we can't really do a manual is because uh, collections as data is not a discrete thing, uh, and it happens, and it doesn't happen in just one siloed part of a library. Um, it potentially touches the work uh, of every existing department, but it also you know, points to the need for some new roles and some new workflows. I should have had this up while I was talking about Las Vegas. So <laughs> that's the library there. It's a nice library. It's a really nice library. Mm -hmm. Highly recommended. A very hot walk from the strobe. Oh my god, it's so hot. <laughs> <laughs> um, another thing, so instead of a manual uh, for you know, how to do collections as data, uh, what we produce, and I really have to give a lot of credit to Hannah Frost at Stanford. Uh, she wrote the bulk of, if not all I'm of, all. it's entirely you know, all of this thing, this <laughs> one document. It's uh, does it does everyone does anyone remember the fifty simple things you can do to save the planet book from the eighties? <laughs> so it was, it was a great book. Uh, um, didn't work. Didn't work, but um, <laughs> <laughs> um, kind of inspired by that. Uh, this is sort of a fifty things you can do. Not all of them are simple, so it's just fifty things uh, you can do. Uh, to have collections as data at your library. Um, we are, we're still working on kind of figuring that out. Um, so we can't release it today, but we can maybe talk about it later and you can look forward to seeing it hopefully in the next couple of weeks. Um, let's see. So let's see. Um, so one more thing to, uh, and this also wasn't on the list of things uh, that we said we would do, uh, methods profiles. So we've talked, to, we have the facets that talk about uh, what different libraries have done to create collections of data, as collections as data. We have the personas that describe who might use these collections as data. And then the method profiles kind of go along with that for you know, what might these personas do. So what is text analysis? What is, what's the geo? Geo, the geo, geo something mm -hmm. one. Yeah. Um, yeah. So just all the different kinds of things people might do to, to give information professionals a, a hint at how people might want to use their data. Um, and that's another thing we might, if, if yeah. anyone's interested in working on one of those later today, we <laughs> can do that. Um, because that's also one of these sort of ongoing collections of things and ongoing collection of resources. Ah, and this is what the, the methods profiles ask for. So just wanted to remind everyone, this is what we said we were gonna do. We kind of did some of it. <laughs> uh, and we added a bunch of other stuff. In the end, I, I think we, uh, we've actually accomplished a heck of a lot of work. And created so many Google Docs, it's amazing. <laughs> um, and so now, uh, but it also, uh, 
didn't solve all of the problems, surprisingly. Uh, so we're sort of thinking about next steps. And I want to pass it over to Lori to talk about how we're doing that. Okay. So we were really happy with the outcome of the IMLS grant. I think we did we did do what we said we would do. We just learned so much along the way that it's the work that needs to be done is bigger than um, I think we even imagined, or at least than I even imagined. I really just thought it was gonna be like, if you have image files, release them like this. And the more we talked to scholars about the ways that they would use materials, the more clear it became that that's just not realistic. So, um, and again, mountains of credit to Thomas Padilla, who leads both projects, Hannah Frost, Elizabeth Rusty Roke, and Sarah Potvin, who worked with us on the IMLS project. And I'm just gonna spend a couple of minutes talking about the project we're starting now with support from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Um, and before we get into the particularities of that grant, I'm gonna step back for a moment and sort of draw out some of the implications of what we've been running into in this sort of tangled and complex world that the IMLS grant helped us see. Um, and that I hope will help explain why the Mellon grant is structured in this particular way that it is. So um, Stuart told me that this might be slightly controversial, but I don't think so. Um, <laughs> libraries are organized for items, meaning all of the people and structures are designed to help move books um, and journals or digital image files, fine, through one at a time. When a scholar wants to use, for instance, a book, um, or even a digital image, they can go to their librarian and say, or, you know, in my library, they could say, we should buy this book. And there will be someone in, a, in the acquisitions department who buys it. And there will be someone in cataloging who catalogs it using standards that are already developed. Um, there will be someone else who moves it from cataloging to get stamped and ready for the shelf. There will be someone who shelves it. And when the scholar wants to check it out, they will talk to a different person whose job it is to keep track of where it is and how it's doing. Um, it's a beautiful system, but if the scholar needs all of them or needs them in some other way or as a stream, um, mostly, in all honesty, they are sent to my department, which is the Digital Scholarship Department, and <laughs> um, we are awesome. We're not quite as awesome as LC Labs, but we are awesome, but we can't replicate the entire library organization in the Digital Scholarship Department. We cannot do that. We can't do all of the things that libraries do for everything that isn't one at a time. So um, lest you get think that I'm just getting too deeply into the weeds of the particularities of library organizations, I'll say first that as far as I'm concerned, libraries, archives, and museums are the infrastructure for humanities research. Um, that's what they were designed to do. Um, the, the infrastructure for humanities research is the research library. Um, so as we attempt to take seriously, as we take seriously, sorry, attempts to think of our collections as data, it really calls out the ways that the problems are actually much more social and cultural than technical. And in order to fix them, we need solutions that are structural, that are based on new kinds of relationships, and that um, engage with the world in a new set of assumptions about what the scholarly and public record should be. I should have warned you that there was a rant coming. I didn't, it's not over. Um, <laughs> but conceiving of collections as data brings our collections into the messy mix of the data that is out in the world. Um, if our collections can be imagined and used as data, that calls attention to the fact that we need to be collecting other kinds of data as well. Um, if ours is one kind of data, then what about all the other kinds of data that are out in the world? The other, if we are making our collections available for computational approaches, what does that say about our responsibility to deal with al algorithmic and computational approaches to data out in the world and the relationship between that data out in the world and the public and historical record? So that's the context that we're kind of, that, that we landed on. We wanted to do this like, here's a, here are functional requirements and here we are looking at the whole world of data. Um, and so the Mellon Grant is not targeted to solve all of that. Um, the grant is designed explicitly though to address structural and technical barriers at the same time and to encourage the new kinds of relationships that we believe are necessary for collections as data to be a successful move. It's organized around a cohort model so that people learn from one another. We're all new to this and change, as we know, takes much longer than a grant-funded period. 
um, what you get for the money. So basically, we are um, we are in a position to award six subgrants um, in two different iterations. So there'll be the first cohort and the second cohort. The first cohort. Um, will have six projects in it, and each project will be led by three people. Th those three people include a disciplinary scholar, someone who is going to use the data, or someone who is going to help create the data, someone for whom this data is a part of the work that they need to do. Um, that's, a dis that's a scholar. Someone who's going to be, who's aware of the kind of work that needs to be done, someone who's on the ground in libraries, and someone who's in an administrative position in libraries to actually re change people's jobs. Someone who has a leadership enough position that, they're, um, that they can make this sustainable. Because we've, we've found so many times that a digital scholarship department, or per a person in a digital scholarship department and a scholar can make a collections as data. They can't make collections as data the way that their library operates. So we've, we've sort of pulled in some, someone from an, a leadership position. So what those people will do is they'll go to a team lead institute and a summative forum at the end, and in the middle, there'll be all sorts of things. And what they have to produce is, yes, a, so we'll give them forty dollars to $80,000. What they have to produce is, yes, a collection says data. They have to make something that presumably the scholar wants to use or to make. Um, and they also have to make a kind of report on how they did the implementation. Technically, what was involved, what decisions got made, how did they make those decisions, what were the technical decisions that they made, and the ethical and policy decisions, and a roles and services model. So that means whose job will it be to support the use of collections as data going forward in this institution? Maybe it's, maybe it's a graduate student fellowship position, possibly, but probably we think it's going to be one of the people who works in the library. Um, this work, this grant, the grant funds cannot be used for contingent labor. We don't want to see little pockets um, that go away. We want to see this work integrated into the work of libraries. And so this roles and services model is one of the pieces that we think is most important to, pr to produce. At the end of this, we'll have 12 examples of here is how a library that did this work, that went through this process, imagines sustained support for the use um, and creation of collections as data. So it sounds a little complicated. The, CF, the call for proposals is out now. It's not that complicated. Um, but, and it's due October 31st. So um, we hope, we're, we're getting lots of interest. We have lots of phone calls with people. Um, and then the, we're gonna evaluate the proposals on these um, basically, um, does it, does it demonstrate innovative organizational thinking? Is it locally sustainable? Is it readily, is there evidence of ready uh, potential for adaptability? Um, also, is the collections as data thing that you're making of significant research value? Um, are you, have you demonstrated a commitment to developing and implementing processes for addressing complex ethical issues um, inherent in this work? Um, and then sort of, are you aware of what's going on in the field? And we hope OU's open source technology for, to aim for interoperability. So that's roughly the proposal that we have going forward. And I, I think we've made the case about why we think that makes sense. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Stuart for the close, I think. Yes. <laughs> um, so, over the course of the IMLS uh, portion and then moving into the Mellon portion, I've very often felt kind of like a reporter. Uh, it's not the case that I, or really any of us in either of the groups are leaders or discoverers or anything like that of collections as data. We sort of noticed something happening and that was kind of reflected in why we did the, the forum first, uh, just to get all the ideas out and write down what people were saying. Um, so um, you know, it's not the case that we invented this work. Uh, the work we've done in large part uh, has been bringing people together, uh, people who are on the front lines doing th this kind of work in their everyday job, um, and uh, listening to their stories, connecting their stories and experiences to others. Um, so these are the people who are at the first Santa Barbara uh, Forum. Um, they're all doing amazing work. Um, 
And these are all the people who are at the, the Las Vegas Forum. And this is not to mention all the people who wrote um, you know, facets for us, who are contributing methods profiles, uh, who commented on early versions of the Santa Barbara Statement, um, people who asked questions, made suggestions, stopped us during the coffee breaks at conferences to talk about things. You know, it really is you know, trying to, uh, this has all been about getting information out of uh, people who do this work all the time. Um, and another thing we want to do is give a shout out to some other initiatives who we really admire uh, and have sometimes some overlapping interests with ours. Uh, we especially want to thank uh, the Documenting the Now project, uh, looking at community archives uh, and social media. Um, also our uh, fellow IMLS grantees with the Design for Diversity, uh, as well as uh, the DLF in general has been extremely supportive uh, from the beginning. I think we probably all met at a DLF event anyway. And then um, they have a lot of interest groups that uh, touch on things we're interested in. I particularly want to call out the Technologies of Surveillance Working Group. Uh, they're doing very great work. Um, these folks are taking a hard look at, at library and archive practice uh, as being caught up in, but also influencing both uh, technical and social change, and, and we want to be part of that. Um, that's actually the final slide. Yes. Thank you very much. So we have in the next in the we have like there's another hour where we're, we have handouts of what these crazy oh Jesus sorry <laughs> um, what the methods templates look like what the um, persona templates look like we have what the examples of the 50 things are we've got all these like to just dig into what did we find, but this, I hope, gives a sense of the, of the big picture. So thanks. Mm -hmm. Are we supposed to be questions? Sorry, are, are there, okay, this is, yes, are there questions? Sorry, we stay. No. Oh, okay. Yes. Sorry, is, was there a question? Thank you very much. This is exciting. Uh, collection is always a subcorpus of something else, of course. Uh, and there's over, quite a bit of overlap between these collections, what we're always thinking. So if we start thinking of the individual collection as data, uh, then it's Difficult. How how do you conceptualize this? Do you have? You go ahead. Um, I mean, I think it, it, it's one of the hardest things, right? Because collections. Um, so I would say I think that's why we are trying to stay so close to the scholarly uses, um, is to say that there isn't a kind of natural break wherein this is the collection size or scope or scale that is correct to release as data because you know of course you could you could depending on what you have you could release your entire collection as data you could create a subset of a collection that is in itself a meaningful collection and release it as data you could um, take a cross section of a whole bunch of collections create a new collection as data um, and I think what we have been interested in is both technically and um, sort of as a workflow practice, what are ways of supporting that range of work? So that yes, here's all of the, here's a dump of everything and, um, and but paying attention to sort of what are the expectations or assumptions about the users of that stuff, about what technology they want to use and what methods they are, they, they are gonna approach that data with. Um, so that bringing, being aware of what those assumptions are helps make those decisions which aren't natural at all and can't be made at a kind of in a vacuum into kind of actionable, oh, well then, then we've made this decision, this is the kind of user, here's the kind of method, that means that we want to release the data in this, at this scale, scope or scale and in this way. Does that answer? I think the only thing I would add to that is, um, I remember the first Santa Barbara, or the only Santa Barbara meeting, the. Uh, uh, I think what I was looking for was, you know, what sorts of methods are people doing, what technology, what tools are they using, what formats do they want, 
And what all of the scholars wanted to talk about endlessly was context. context. They wanted context for the collections. Where did this come from? How did you get it? Uh, how can I be sure it's real? What other collections is it related to? So, I, and that really kind of reshaped how we were thinking about this. Is you know, these metadata questions were actually going to be uh, really tricky and absolutely crucial uh, for particularly this reason. We have yeah. to know how is this, how are these items related to each other, and then how are those relations related to other relations? Um, yeah. just keep talking. Okay, great, that's better. Um, yes, so thank you both. Um, I had a question for Lori. You used the phrase out in the world a few times to describe data that's not in the institution, and I, I don't want to you know, split hairs and be silly, but I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about what you mean by that. Goodness, that was not in this, my, I did not think that one through. Um, but, I, <laughs> but I do, I mean, I think, um, I think a lot about um, the ways that, you know, the tension between the, the work that libraries, archives, and museums, the way that we imagine ourselves as kind of holding the cultural record, and then the, the on-the-ground reality, which while I'm being, this is too strong a way to describe it, I think it's, it's too close to being true that the way that libraries acquire thing is that things is that they look at what's for sale, by vendors, and that's what they acquire, and then that's what they take care of, and that the information that normal people, um, scholars included, rely on to learn is mostly not at this moment for sale by published ven publisher vendors. It is mostly on the open web. It is mostly coming through various social media networks. It is mostly um, in other forms, so that and, and our organ, our, that's what I mean by out in the world, is all of the sources of information and um, pieces of the kind of um, public record that are not um, making their way easily into library, archival, and museum systems of care for the record. So yeah, I mean, I, and I, it's sort of, you know, it overwhelms me, but it's also, I think, that's that's what I was getting at. Um, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation and also, you know, a very timely initiative for those of us who are not from the library science, but from library science, but from the digital humanities. Um, this was all like music to our ears. <laughs> um, and there's many things that I, we don't have to go through all of them, but lots of things that you said rang really very true, that the issues are not only technical, but actually cultural and struc structural and all these things that I completely agree with. Um, but there's one thing that I, and I, I apologize because I repeat something that I talked about in my talk on Monday, but I want to throw out at you, is that you talk about um, collections of data. By the way, that's also, in terms of branding, a, a <laughs> fantastic, I mean, Fantastic name. So you talk about um, libraries providing collections as data, mm -hmm. and you talk about creating new collections. And there's a there's another um, layer of possibility, which is scholars doing work on yeah. collections, producing layers of annotation. Yeah. And the question of how does that get ingested back into the mm -hmm. library? So if if you've done some work on that, I'd like to hear a little bit about it. Yeah, do you wanna, do you want me to? Okay. Um, yes, so it's, in fact, the actual way that I met Thomas Padilla was by standing up at a, um, at a conference um, that was a, no offense, no one here was there, it was a terrible conference, but, <laughs> but I met Thomas Padilla, so that, that it worked, um, but, but was, was in, standing up and asking a question about ways that we might conceptualize the repository, the library's repository of collections and the repo, like the Git repo that can be forked and cloned and um, well, yeah, all the, all the things that people do to Git repos to enhance them and what might um, an investigation of the intersection of those two uses of the word repository look like and I still, I mean, we, talk about it all the time. And I wish Thomas were here because he could probably rattle off like 15, you know, 
um, there's this project that's looking at that and this project. I, I will say it comes up all the time and I think where, where Stuart and I in our work at the University of Pennsylvania Libraries, or I work there, he doesn't work there, um, where, but we work together. <laughs> where we are landing is on using the metaphor of publishing to help decide um, basically like, oh, could there be a published version of a data set that is a subset of another data set? Um, and what might it look like for us to collect that published version? Because we want to, I mean, libra all libraries want to collect that stuff. The problem is it's not as easy for us to make selection decisions and we can't collect all of it. Um, we can't collect all of it for workflow reasons because we can't, we don't want to we don't want to collect things that we don't, aren't keeping track of. Um, and we also can't collect it for, I mean, I would say for like environmental storage reasons. Like we just don't, there's no reason to be storing every, some, everyone who sees themselves as a scholar who's creating something that they would like the library, kind of in some imagined library to hold on to forever. Like that can't be the way that we decide what to store. Um, and so having systems to help select and carve out what versions of public, of data look like is a big piece of it. And I'll also say the metadata sort of returning to the, as a, as a side note, returning to the first forum, we had these brilliant metadata librarians and they were like, you know, the idea that scholars could help make better metadata was so exciting to them. They wanted that so much. They were not protective of their metadata. They were like, oh my God, you're, you're if, we, if we've got it wrong, and of course we've got it wrong a lot of the time, um, help us fix it. The problem is we just don't have systems to do that. I guess I'll just reiterate that point. And one of the, I, I, one of the things we really had to fight for in the new Mellon phase is to get the disciplinary scholar as a, an official, permanent, really invested, committed member uh, of, of this team. And I, you know, part of that is this conversation We've been, you know, libraries are, are always talking about publishing models and open access and, and collections and uh, of what that means in a digital world. And, I, and scholars can't sift that out. It's a really hard conversation and they need to be part of it. Um, so uh, yeah, that, you know, that's why we fought for that. And I don't know if that's going to actually solve the thing you're talking about, but yeah. you know, just making sure everyone knows kind of what's at stake when we're making these decisions, but also like you know, what the opportunities are. Right, because I think that's the, the idea is like, if we can get the scholars who want to do this and the people making the systems to just work on it together, we might be able to get somewhere. But scholars kind of ha raising these concerns in one land and librarians raising a set of concerns in another is not going to get us there. So we're just like, all right, we're gonna pay you to s try do, to do one thing actually together. And that's like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So I actually wanted to ask about specifically that. Um, uh, at our center, we've started a reading group around collections of data and I've worked with it with some of my research groups too. And, and one of the things that I've started to realize is that collections of data is actually an invitation to a lot of meetings. Yeah. <laughs> And part of the reason for that is that it seems like there are specific constellations, sort of organizational constellations that, that are required to do a lot of this work, yep. right? And so for example, one of, the, one of the early responses that we've gotten from the catalogers in our library is that that's a somewhat risky proposition to think about incorporating researchers into the, mm -hmm. the handling of metadata because of the descaling yep. of catalogers and the, and the sort of loss of a lot of that labor. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be curious if there's been any feedback that you've gotten from people sort of out in the world um, who have started to, to I think, do what the CFP alone invites people to do, which is to go to their campuses and say, okay, we want to do this. Mm -hmm. And then somebody says, okay, well, what does that actually mean? Yeah, that's, I think the facets specifically are designed for that because they are this, one of the big questions is how did you, like, these are people, sometimes they're scholars, sometimes they're museum professionals, sometimes they're library professionals, who, d who made a collection z as data. Um, and the, the second question I think in the facet is, how did you make the case? Um, you know, because different arguments win in different conversations. And so we, 
um, it's it's it was sort of the first thing that came up. It came up all the time. Is there is a lone person who wants to support computational use of a collection, and they are made immediately aware that in order to do that, they need to confront a massive number of totally real, actual problems that are not just like someone who doesn't like change, but are actually like that person knows a lot about the way that the 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 work that they have, the work they are expected to do, and um, the work they're allowed to do. And, you know, so the making the case is a big part of it. And I don't, um, I mean, I, I kind of think it just has to happen one, one little piece at a time. I don't know. Yeah, I wish there was, some, maybe we can think of some sort of infrastructural change that would <laughs> allow that to happen. Uh, everywhere we've seen, it's just been like a handful or maybe just one like just really great collaborator who gets it and is willing to put in the time, and they're usually full faculty because yep. that's the way that works. So. Yeah. Um, hi, Susan Garfinkel. I know both of you on Twitter. Oh, yeah. So. Look at you. <laughs> and I'm an, <laughs> an early alum of humanities computing at Penn when we called it humanities computing. Um, I partly wanted to ask a similar question to what. Um, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, had Thomas had asked. But um, to add to that, I've been very taken with um, the phrase um, transformative remediation, which I first heard from Daniel Shore, who works on the Six Degrees of Francis Bacon Project. So I wanted to kind of build on that idea. And the idea of transformative remediation is that you come back to documents or records or library materials that you already have and add new metadata or mm -hmm. interpretation and you find a way to re, you know, mediate it, remediate it in a way that actually is transformative, which is what he argues they're doing. But um, so I work here at the Library of Congress and um, I'm now speaking entirely for myself <laughs> as a scholar who has tried to fit in in the library world uh, as a subject specialist with a strong digital interest for about 15 years. And so my question, um, has to do with the idea of collections as data and how we can go back to that very first example um, that Lori showed with the Friends Hospital um, where they were trying to think about adding value to historical content. Because what I'm finding in this big complicated world of the Library of Congress is that collections as data is getting a lot of attention but it's over here. It's over, well, it's in this room where we don't have, we have 2,000 plus employees at the Library of Congress and I think we may have a dozen or fewer mm -hmm. in this room who actually work here today because it's seen as off on the side yep. and the other piece of it is that it's getting a lot of attention but in the library world it's more about the mark data than about, and I'll give a very specific example we have at the Library of Congress that I would love to see something done with and then I'll shut up and let you guys talk. Um, we have the um, collection of WPA ex-slave narratives which were interviews done by people who were born in slavery, I'm sorry, done with people who were born in slavery by uh, people who worked for the federal government during the 1930s. So this was, this was the, the last generation of people born in slavery. And so we have these narratives there, you know, three to 10 pages type script. And we have their names and some of them we have some photographs. Well, we also at this library have one of the premier genealogical libraries in the world. And we could so easily do exactly what you were talking about earlier of finding, digging out that information. We could, and we have one of the largest newspaper collections right. in the world. I bet you we could find a biography of every single one of those people and add it as a supplement to yeah. those narratives that were done using census data, newspapers, right. all kinds of other you know, uh, institutional uh, histories, whatever, um, but we're not doing that. And I think at this library, it's because we see that as beyond our job. And so what, um, it, it's something that scholars might do, mm -hmm. but a library might yep. not. So I'm wondering if you could talk about that kind of difficult bridge right there. I mean, it's like, yeah, those are all real. I think that, I'm so glad that you brought that. I think one of the things we've done um, pretty consistently is try to resist the limiting of what collections as data means to it means releasing mark data or it means um, uh, I mean it, it's almost like there's a lot of there's a lot of ways that people either scholars but mostly I think people who work in libraries can imagine collections as data where it's only a very slight shift in what we're doing but I think what you're raising which is this or what we were raising at the end this issue of 
um, and, and it came up at the right at the forum, what's the boundary between making a collection and describing a collection as scholarly work and making a collection and describing a collection as professional work um, that is done within a library context and that collections as data really invites that um, tension to some degree because libraries have always been engaging in scholarly practices when they describe stuff and um, and yet describing, you know, our practices have gotten so standardized, as Jim said, where most books that come out, unless you work at the Library of Congress, the, <laughs> the person describing it is just copying the same record that they got, and they're not, they're not seen, and they do, they're not seen or valued as doing a kind of intellectual work of deciding what this is, a, what is the aboutness of this object. Like, they're not, they're just copying the record, uh, or they're paying a student to copy the record, and then they're doing some work on it. So asking, doing collections as data, it, there are these implications that it means deciding what the boundaries of an object of scholarship are, and um, then describing it and contextualizing it to a degree that other people could use it, and that it's, it, I think it just takes us kind of way back in time to some degree. Um, and, I, and I do think that building in ways for, um, for libraries to understand differently how they collect so that they, they can collect some work that scholars do to reimagine and recreate um, citizen scholars or others, to reimagine or recreate their collections, and then that the idea that libraries could collect that collection as data and offer it, right? It's, I think, I think that's where we're heading. I think we'll get there. But I mean, it is part of what the, uh, the Mellon grant is going to try to do, and I, I hope we get some really successful models out of that. You know, there, I feel like I'm, well, so the reason we had, we were kind of insisting on having a, someone from the library who has real power to also be on the team is precisely this thing <laughs> that you're pointing to and what Laurie was pointing to. It, uh, collections as data needs to be all through the library. Uh, and it can't just be located in digital scholarship or, or wherever. Uh, and I, I think back to my time at, at UNC as the digital scholarship librarian, uh, where you know someone came to me with an idea for a project. Not only I was sort of uh, the stacks team and the uh, acquisitions department, uh, but also the publisher. You know, I you know, had to like put to answer all the questions for literally every stage of it. You know. Uh, in one person, you know, sometimes you have one department, but this really is, you know, there is an entire library organization that, and there are analog departments for most of the steps. Um, so hopefully the, the Mellon grant will surface some, some good ways to do that. We'll see. Uh, well, thank you very much for being here. Uh, I also wanna thank you for modeling the acknowledgement of participants in the process. Mm -hmm. I think that is um, something that we don't see in a lot of other um, spaces and um, something that we want to try to um, respond to as well. And I wonder how you see that represented in the way other people are responding to the call to provide information, um, acknowledging practice and even the time people to take to share their ideas and thoughts converts into cultural capital, converts into other conversations that we're having more widely here around labor and the real work versus the not real work and who is seen in the practice and not seen in the practice. So I'm just wondering if that has come out already in the kind of first sets of outputs or if you expect that that sort of acknowledgement of who's been involved might also surface in um, this next phase. I mean, thank you for that. That's a really kind, and, and hopefully Stuart will say something more <laughs> meaningful as I'm babbling. But I guess I would say, you know, to me the the kind of problem space that we're interested in, or that I'm interested in, which is this kind of broadly speaking, like the public and cultural record is currently um, unjust, unjust and also totally precarious. Um, and so that's, if, if, I can, if we conceive of that as the problem space, then the solution is quite obviously going to require like a mad number of people thinking along many different lines that have absolutely, you know, we, we can't center, it would be crazy for us to center ourselves 
in that because we are not at the center of that. There is no center to that. It's a, just a widespread human problem that an animal, unfortunately, rocks. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's a huge, it's just a sort of global problem that requires as many people thinking in using whatever expertise they bring to whatever pieces they can. So, you know, I really want libraries to be reorganized. And I believe libraries as institutions can and need to be a part of a kind of civil society, basically. But I think that that's to get there, we just need a huge range of people involved. And so I guess that would be my, like, I don't, I wouldn't imagine working on any project that where the outcome is going to be like, I made this thing because that's not the kind of outcome I'm interested in. But I, that was really an indirect answer. Maybe you can say something more I, clear. Don't put that pressure on me. Uh, <laughs> I, so I, I, was a, I was probably a mediocre digital scholarship librarian and kind of a bad subject specialist because I got that job when someone retired. And um, so, but you know, the, uh, uh, the uh, DocSouth data project really was pretty cool, but I got out of my element instantly. I didn't know how most of that stuff worked. And that we just see that over and over again whenever we open up this conversation. You know, there's so many people with such deep expertise and so many years of experience in doing this. Uh, part of it is I don't want to be responsible for having to <laughs> you know, uh, speak for that. Uh, so um, you know, uh, when we figure out, you know, we don't know anything about this, we have to find the people who do. Um, so that's, once again, going back to that role of kind of feeling like a reporter, just trying to get the right people in the room and ask the right questions. Um, this is such a great, uh, what, this is one of the sessions I really was looking forward to coming to um, because collections of data is exactly what, what my work is. And I'm here, and, and, and we want to remember this is Doria uh, finding ways to reach out, you know, outside of Europe. Um, I'm here as a representative of an underrepresented and sometimes oppressed uh, community of citizen scientists. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think one of the things that's interesting is that um, there's a kind of an implicit bigness to your sense of the library. Mm -hmm. um, and that's totally appropriate. However, what, what, I, think, and w what I think would be great um, is if you would uh, be open mm -hmm. to one of those six cohorts being a proposal from uh, the citizen science world where my faculty is a world-class personal learning network. Yeah. They're almost all European because I'm working on a ground truth storage format called Magazine GTS that's a uh, ontological stack on Cydoc CRM, FRBRO, and Press OO to do serial publications. Um, those folks um, are, are just invaluable to me. For my 25th uh, wedding anniversary, my wife and I funded the digitization of the 48 issues of Soft Talk into the Internet Archive. And then we donated the physical collection to Stanford to go into the, um, the co collection of the history of science and technology. Because my buddy there is Henry Lowood. He's mm -hmm. the curator of that collection. So. If I were to present a proposal, my the person from the library I would recommend is Henry. Um, it, it, the important thing, I mean, the Internet Archive yeah. is just one example of where collections as data will happen. And citizen scientists are the change insurgents pushing in yeah. from the, the boundary. Yeah. And so I think it would be super to have uh, within that mix of, of six that are yeah. justifiably going to be you know, doing the library yeah. in the biggest good world. But we need to enter the 21st century that's already in the wild. Yeah. Citizen scientists are an underrepresented and, and, and need to be yeah. nurtured and, and brought into the thing. So, no, that's a great, thank you. Yeah. I think that's really valuable. Mm -hmm. Yes. Absolutely. So you would take a proposal like that? Yeah, I mean, yes. Yeah. We would, I don't oh, know that we would right. give you the money, but we'll <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> yes, Just, I love that idea. Yeah. 
Just a comment from a researcher who works uh, on metadata collections. We do, we do quite a bit of work on, on early modern uh, library catalog things. And we are extremely pleased with the work that the cataloging people are doing right. and appreciating the fact that it's been developed over hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, because that data then is something that we can actually work with. Mm -hmm. And, and we, we really wouldn't care so much about more of interpretation in there. Uh, so f for example, I mean, we also, we tried to work with the Finnish national broadcasting. We got, after long discussions, they gave us the metadata mm -hmm. of everything. They had a monopoly on television right. for a very long time. So we got a data dump from their meta metadata from 1960s to end of 1990s. So we wanted to study that, uh, how different political parties are how much TV time they get and, and, and so forth from the metadata. But it's so patchy, they don't follow any type of rules. <laughs> so it completely depends who, who had been yeah. the summer worker there. Somebody says that there's a man stroking a dog and a little girl walks by and, and sort of describing right. everything. And, and, and then the, there's another person who just says that Matti appears on television, just <laughs> talking about people and their first names. So basically we couldn't do anything with that. And, and, and with library, I mean, that when people yeah. following analytical bibliographical rules, I mean, that then you have to do all kinds of harmonization in order to get that right. for so the way that you want to work with it. Cause, but there are two different purposes, of course. I mean, the librarian wants to uh, preserve, I mean, about as much information as the physical object as possible, and researchers probably want to do something else with that. Right. But, but the, the question of having a sort of systematic way where people in different libraries have worked together so that we can have these wonderful integrated catalogs. Yeah. So that, that is really, really something that sh still should be cherished. Yeah, I think that's, um, thank you. And, and, and I, I know I personally tend to, um, because I'm, I'm, I'm not a scholar, I've worked in libraries my whole 20 year career or whatever, I find myself taking the side of of, of the boutique, of the peculiar, of the one at a time, because I work in libraries where that argument needs to be made, and it's, it's very valuable to hear the kind of right, but actually standardization is extraordinarily valuable, and um, so thank you for that. I think it's, yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry we've kept you up here so long. <laughs> I, have a, I have a super basic question. Um, I love the idea of the computational methods profiles. Mm -hmm. um, how do I get them? <laughs> oh, I should put those on the internet. Um, <laughs> Would you? Yeah, no, so we, we only have one so far, and then two that'll be produced by this conference at the end of, of October. So the one we have is for text analysis, and then honestly, one of the, and it, they're really specifically, it's not like we think the world needs another explanation of what text mining is. It's that we think that we know, we've heard from people who work in libraries where they're not already best friends with their DH faculty or there isn't a DH faculty member at their small college who wants to do text mining, that they need to know like, so what format do you want, right? That's the question that we're looking to answer with these. Okay, you do text mining, what do you want? And so it's, um, so we have, I mean, truly like literally handouts and a Google Drive, which in the, whenever the next time that we're up here, we will share the Google Drive I mean, it's not a secret, but yes. Um, and the, the, so yes, we'll share that. But I don't, we're not gonna, they're not like published yet until the conference at the end of the month. Okay, thank you. <laughs>